Do you ever wonder what would happen if, well, if... If you give a dad a podcast. I'm what you call a nerdy fan. I nerd out at this stuff. Hardcore. You'll hear me talk about anime on here. You'll hear me talk about Power Rangers. You'll hear me talk about wrestling on here. Okay. I had an axe handle with a twisted T on it. <laughs> It's <laughs> right after that Twisted T video went viral. And man, they went out and grabbed it and smacked a dude in the head with it. It was so... That's great. That's- I'd like to thank this podcast as a nostalgia moment for me. It's a show where I can talk about whatever I want. I- I'm, a, I'm a human and a chiropractor. There was a picture of me. It looked like I was on the side of a ramen box over in China. But- <laughs> so I took my kids with me to Comic-Con. I thought that was really cool. Well, I don't know if my wife should listen to this podcast. We'll cut that part out. <laughs> you know, you hope. Like, and then Robert said this. <laughs> if you give a dad a podcast, available now on all podcasting platforms. Did you ever wonder what could have been with the AWA had things gone differently? Had their fortunes gone differently? Had certain wrestlers not left and perhaps more money would have been at the disposal of the Ganyas? Well, wonder no further. You can go to Brad Drake's YouTube channel and experience the 1987 Supermod for yourself. As Brad Drake starts off in May 1987, along with Greg Ganya, Baron Von Rotschke, Vern Ganya himself, Nick Bockwinkel, Larry Zabisco, Kurt Hennig, and a slew of others as he plays and saves the AWA. Hello everyone, this is Brian Ferguson, the host of Bumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. I want to tell you about a new podcast out called Fouls Count Anywhere. It is a classic pro wrestling podcast that brings you the legends of wrestling with true wrestling fans Chris DiCarlo and Charlie Turner. They bring on guests that are legends in this business as well as wrestlers of today, promoters, referees, you name it, they have them on there, folks. And I encourage you to listen to them. If you're on YouTube, watch them. They put, drop every Saturday. They have their podcast. And they drop it in the afternoon. So look forward to that podcast coming out. Falls Count Anywhere podcast with Chris DiCarlo and Charlie Turner. Folks, you will not be disappointed. I guarantee it. And enjoy the podcast. Hey everyone, this is Brian Ferguson, the host of Bumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. We are on here today because of you, viewers and watchers like you. In order to continue the podcast, we need to monetize our YouTube channel so we can get guests on that require financial compensation. That's where viewers like you come in. If you subscribe today, we can get that number up to 1,000. And as an incentive, the 1,000th subscriber will receive a free t-shirt just like this and receive a book from the legendary George Shire on his Minnesota golden age of wrestling from Vern Ganyu to the Road Warriors, signed by George Shire himself. So please get on there, tell your friends to subscribe today and when you hit that 1000 mark, you're gonna get a t-shirt like this. I'm gonna reach out to you. You're gonna be coming on the show as a guest and receive that book the Minnesota's Golden Age of Wrestling from Vern Gagne of the Road Warriors, signed by George Shire. So get on there today, subscribe, and please enjoy the podcast. Thank you for joining another edition of Bumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. I'm Brian Ferguson. My guest today was one of the hottest rising young stars of the mid-80s. He is best known for his time in the NWA and was a three-time NWA World Junior Heavyweight Champion. He has worked in most of the independent promotions and has held numerous singles and tag team titles. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Denny Brown. Denny, thanks for coming on the show today. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me, Brian. I appreciate you uh, giving me the honor and the pleasure and the opportunity to be able to tell everybody a little bit about me and uh, my past. Yeah, it's it's great. I I saw you on uh, Starcade eighty five. Four. Oh, wait, four. 
uh, the other night I was watching it. I watched a bunch of them the other night. So, uh, and I saw you on there. You were the first match with Mike Davis for that junior world junior heavyweight championship. What was yeah. that? What was that like for you that night at Starcade? I mean, you were a young man, and just tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, actually, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I think Mike was more excited about it than anybody else, even yeah. even me. You know, because yeah, you know, you know, Mike and I, we were down here in Florida. You know, championship wrestling from Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, before we went to uh, Charlotte. You know, mm -hmm. Starcade. But Dusty was the booker here. You know, and controlling everything, and yeah. as far as what went on here in Florida. Yeah. So, and he told me one night when we were in Orlando that uh, we had a uh, junior heavyweight championship tournament, and he, and he, you know, he come up behind me and he told me about that, and he said, "And and you won. This is a year before. This, yeah, right. It was a year before anything, even you know, before I even went to Charlotte. Even though I didn't even had no clue I was going to Charlotte." Yeah. But you know, to the time that I was here in Championship Wrestling in Florida, CWF, uh, I, I traveled with Mike Rotunda mm -hmm. and Mike Davis. Okay. So they became my, you know, three best friends at that point in time. Especially Mike Rotunda and I, because we, we, you know, when we drove to towns and this that or hung out together, we'd always go end up somewhere. My brother lived in Lauderdale. We'd go fishing or whatever. Okay. So anyway, we traveled together all over the place, you know, and then Mike Davis and I became really good friends. I remember when we were going across Highway 60, you know, going heading south, and there's a rattlesnake in the middle of the road, and he wanted to get out and play with it, and Mike Rotunda. <laughs> and, and, and Mike Rotunda stops, you know, so he lets him get out and go play with it, and he's got this umbrella. And he's over there, he's playing with this rattlesnake, you know, and I'm right behind him. I'm not getting too close because I'm, you know, I don't care for rattlesnakes to begin with. Yeah. And he's poking at it with that umbrella, and I goose him. <laughs> and, oh, geez, he, turned, he jumps three feet in the air, turns around, and smacks me right across the head with that umbrella. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, the history, the things that Mike and I, uh, both Mikes, but, but but Mike Davis, you know, in this situation, was, yeah. you know, pretty much key to the story is that uh, we're good friends. Mm -hmm. And he'd always come, you know, he's, he, he, we had a, I had a match uh, in, uh, in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And uh, they all were up there watching the match, Dusty, Mike, and all this and everything. And, you know, it was a, a really, really nice, good match. And, you know, I walked back up in there and everybody's like in awe, you know, that it's the first match. And it was with Barry, Barry of the uh, Horowitz. Okay. And, and uh, when I got back up there, Mike's standing there, he goes, damn, he says, they're going to send you somewhere, and they're going to make you really strong. And, uh, wow, that was the nicest comment from anybody anywhere. Yeah. But getting into the, the point to where, you know, that uh, you know, I had the first match with Mike Davis, Mike was ecstatic over the fact that he was going to be able to drop the belt to me. Wow. It was an honor to him because, you know, the, the he, he just thought so much of me and just, yeah. you know, it, it, it was just so, it made me feel so good inside that the guy really, you know, because, you know, a lot of guys, they get a little animosity here and there about, yeah. you know, small trivial type things. and mm -hmm. But he truly, truly was ecstatic over the fact that he was the one that they chose to be able to do that. Yeah. And, you know, going into the match, you know, it was exciting for me. You know, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I never really got the full effect of everything about being in wrestling the way everybody else did. Because, I, you know, one, one of my hardest things to do is to be able to talk on TV or the camera or do a promo or stuff like that. You know, I wasn't good at it, you know. But, you know, going into this and all that, you know, that match in itself for the first time becoming world junior heavyweight champion was uh, one of the biggest honors in the whole wide world. 
Yeah. And, you know, when I first met Dusty, you know, he was coming in and changing out, uh, you know, as a booker because Tory Funk Jr. was the booker here in Florida. Mm-hmm. He fired me. Oh. Yeah. Well, not really fired me, but said, I just don't have a spot for you. So, yeah. same thing, I guess. So, you're not working every night anymore. <laughs> so, you know, you either, you know, you know to me, it's, you know, you're fired. And it broke my heart. And I'm going, Dusty, but I'm work. Yeah. He says, I know, kid. He goes, but you can work TV every week. <laughs> so I did. And then yeah. went all the way up to this. And I worked my butt off. And I did. Yeah. And, you know, so it led into the fact that it was that I had the opportunity to be able to go in and uh, at Starcade, one of the biggest shows ever. Well, we did a few Dusty was you know infamous for doing big shows like that because we did you know the thing down in Miami, you know the mm-hmm. big show, we did. Yeah. and that was what led us to leaving Florida and going to North Carolina anyway. But being out there working with Mike, you know, the, uh, who I've always had great matches with, great. Uh, you know, chemistry and everything as far as, uh, you know, being in the middle of the ring and just getting out there and having a good time and putting on a good show and, yeah. you know, just, just having a good night. And uh, that was one of them. And being able to, to win that yeah. for the first time was, you know, a kid that never really ever thought. And, you know, my whole – my I never thought in the whole – you know, my life as far as, you know, growing up or any of this, so that I would ever be a professional wrestler. Was I never saw, you know, my whole thing was not that I had intended to become a wrestler. Right. Well, let's talk I, about I, that a little bit. Let's, let's talk about your childhood growing up. Where did you grow up and, and kind of tell us about your, your uh, upraising? Uh, well, I grew up here in St. Petersburg, Florida where I'm still at and I'm a one block over from where I grew up, where I was raised as a child. Oh, okay. We live in two different areas here. I was born in Hawaii and, uh, you know, we, uh, moved around a little bit cause my dad was a uh, Marine in you know, career Marine okay. a drill instructor. So life was, that's how we lived life. <laughs> uh, yeah. We were in boot camp for a lot of years. <laughs> But I don't remember anything about Hawaii. Born in, born in Hawaii, and we moved back to North Carolina, I guess, for a short period of time. Uh, Midway Park, you know, you see the commercials, you know, of all that stuff today mm-hmm. on the, you know, the um, Camp Lejeune, which is where we lived at Midway Park for a couple of years, mm-hmm. um, where that got that big class action lawsuit going on mm-hmm. now. If you yeah. lived in Midway Park or you lived around or on the base, or you drink the water. So, yeah, I was part of that, too. So, and then we we moved out of uh, North Carolina because he went to become a drill instructor. Okay. And, and then we were over in Beaufort, which is Paris Island. Yeah. And, and Dad was a Marine from the day, you know, he joined the Marines at 15. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So... He got through that way back then. It was kind of a different, you know, scenario. Yeah. But that's who he was. I mean, yeah. that was, he was, you know, his name was Coy Brown. He's an old country boy, you know, Native American, uh, Kickapoo Indian out of Oklahoma. Okay. And uh, he was just a hard guy. He's, you know, he, he didn't take crap from nobody. He just, you know, he was... He was as tough as they come. He'd fight. Yeah. He, he, you know, he, he say anything, do anything, whatever. Yeah. He, he either fought or he'd knock you out. <laughs> yeah. And that's the type of guy he was. And then, you know, and I was the youngest of three boys anyway. You know, so I had two okay. older brothers. And uh, so and I was not a big kid, so you can imagine I wasn't that tall as, you know, being a big kid, you know, even in wrestling as it was. So I was even smaller, mm-hmm. you know, as a, you know, growing up. And so it was just one of those things where I just, you know, didn't really know that much about it. You know, I yeah. had no idea about wrestling at that point. But anyway, after all that and everything, Dad decided to join the pistol team and took off and left us. Oh gosh! He, yeah, he traveled. He traveled the world, and uh, you know, doing shooting matches and everything. And my yeah. mom and 
uh, one, her sister and my grandmother, they all were living in St. Petersburg, and uh, we had three houses. My, my grandma lived on one side. We lived in the middle, and my aunt and her three, three kids lived the house next door. So three houses in a row. There's six kids, grandmother, and, and two sisters. Yeah. Mean as shit. And, uh, you know, they, so, you know, then, then she, they had another sister and, and they were, they were a pair here in St. Petersburg. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, so I kind of grew up around that as well, you know, and, and my dad, he, he, when he'd come back or he'd come home or on leave or, you know, in between matches and all that stuff, mm-hmm. you know, he'd, he was pretty strict on us. Yeah. You know, you know, anytime that we, we weren't allowed to argue. We couldn't have a, a, we couldn't have animosity in between us or couldn't say anything ugly to each other. And my brothers, because he said, you know, if you, if you got that kind of an issue or a problem, you're going to settle. It. Yeah. So my dad used to make us when we get into arguments and stuff, you know, little spats like that and put all the furniture up against the walls in the house, make us get on our knees, face to face, stand over us with a belt, and make us fight it out. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and the first one stopped, first one cried, he'd whip. And he didn't stop until he was done, you know. And the same thing with dinner. He'd come home every night, and he'd walk in the front door, walk out the back door, line all three of us up against the wall uh, outside the house, whip all three of us because it didn't matter if you did anything or the other guys did anything Mm. you're all guilty you're all getting whipped and i don't take favorites wow yeah wow okay yeah that was pretty much uh my youngest years you know how i I, what i you know as far as how i grew up yeah well you know every we had a hair had our head shaved every saturday fingernails clipped and if you were a neighbor and you walked through the backyard while he's cutting the hair you got your hair cut too oh jeez. <laughs> okay wow yeah yeah he yeah he was he didn't care he didn't he didn't care about anything or anybody he, he, he yeah he was all about his world coy brown wow and um, yeah so that was dad and you know, mom was a great woman, loved her boys and all that, raised and stuff. And, you know, she did most of it on her own, raised yeah. three boys by herself. So, which yeah. was free. You, know, you got to really give it to her for you know doing the things that she did to make sure that we had food on the table. Right. Yeah. Clothes on our backs and shoes on our feet. You know, yeah. That's the kind of woman she was. Yeah. Yeah. So. Then we uh, we lived in a couple of different houses over here. That first house we lived over was uh, across from the uh, down the street from a baseball field. So I started playing baseball at eight years old. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I was pretty good, you know. And uh, so I played, but I was tiny a little bit, and I used to get walks all the time. And I was I could run so dang fast, <laughs> I'd get a home run off of a walk. <laughs> yeah. so I'd take off running and somebody would figure well we're going to get you on you round first base and uh, get you out at first base well if you get in a hurry and you throw the ball and they don't catch it I'm off to second base and if yeah. you, know, you pick the ball up and you go to second and he don't catch it and I'm going to third yeah <laughs> and, and I ended up getting yeah I'd, I'd be home before they even knew what happened <laughs> Yeah, don't don't start playing that game because I was gone. Yeah, and only really, I changed my back pocket because I wanted to get a soda at the, after the game and get my bubble gum and uh, baseball cards, you know, too. You know, yeah, I'm, right. I'm hanging into my back pocket so I don't lose the change in my back pocket. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, and running as fast as I can. But it was hilarious, you know, because I, I made the strike zone so small they couldn't even throw the, they couldn't they, nobody could hit the strike zone with me. <laughs> yeah, wow. Oh. Yeah, well, so it was good times, you know, back yeah. those days, you know. 
And but it, you know, we grew up. I grew up from there. We moved to a couple, one other house, and then we ended up over here in a little area called Azaleaville. Okay. And um, it was a really good neighborhood. You went to, you know, we we were kind of a neighborhood crowd, kids and this and that and everything else. And and um, you know, we, they. We used to, this guy came in from New York and put a pizza place in and called Sir Pizza. And, you know, that was one of our fa- my favorite places. But we hung out there because the all the kids, that'd be 20, 30 kids out there. Yeah. You know, all the time. We used to drink beer all the time. And, you know, we'd buy it and go sit out on the railroad tracks because they were tracks, the train tracks back in those days. Right. Now it's the Pinellas Trail. And, uh, they used to call us the Sir Pizza Boys, the game. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't like that name too much, but yeah, was, yeah, we used to, you know, have rival areas. I mean, we weren't gangs, you know, thug gangs, but you know, just local. Right. The Beach Boys, you know, had their places. You know, the Eighth Street Gang, you know, that, that was out of Paso Grill Beach and some other, you know, Pinellas Park, which is old redneck country boys back in those days. Yeah. Well, I guess how we kind of grew up. We drank beer. We'd get all, you know, we'd send somebody out to get beer and we'd hang out there on the railroad track and had a big ditch on each side. And the cops would come out and they'd come onto one side and they'd get out of the car. And as soon as they get pulled up to the street, we'd go across the track to the other side on the ditch. And back in those days, they couldn't leave their vehicles. Uh, so they'd have to get in and drive all the way back around down the other streets and come back around to the other side by that time we'd already walked back over to the other side <laughs> uh, uh, so we you know young kids i'm 12 years old you know out there just oh gee yeah, we, we had a lot of fun but it was a great it's a great neighborhood here uh great area and then we got up towards more you know towards uh junior high and high school and all that yeah. and we had a guy that's uh, pretty famous too. His name is Richard Blood. Yes. And, uh, and uh, yeah, he hung. He grew up down the street here too. So he's just, okay. he's because he, once we got over here, you know, when Sir Pizza went away, we were the Azalea Boys. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so he's one of the, he's also one of the Azalea Boys. Uh, he we used to hang out at the hamburger place. You know, we had a place over on Central Avenue called Sandy's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it was like uh, like one of the old sock hop things, you know, mm-hmm. that they used to have, you know, the thing that ran out and all that. But they, they didn't get on roller skates or nothing like that. But we all pull up there. Richard was a uh, – well, I'll tell you his name now. You you know – you yeah. may know, you know, it's Ricky Steamboat. Ricky Steamboat, yeah. 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 Yeah, so, you know. Yeah, he was one of the badasses in the, you know, the neighborhood back in those days. And, you know, his brother Arthur was the same age as my brother, okay. and uh, really good friends. So, you know, I've seen them all. You know, they were always around. We used to get out there, and Richard always, you know, built uh, race cars and all that stuff because he was into that stuff. And the old, okay. his dad had a gas station out on the beach, so you know, he, Rick was into that stuff, and we used to sit out there at the Sandy's at the place and we'd Clorox the tires and burn them and smoke them. And, <laughs> and you know, we, yeah, we had a lot of fun back in them days. It was really nice. And, um, yeah. but before we moved over here, you know, when, um, uh, when I was next door to my cousins and everything, we used to go, we used to watch championship wrestling from Florida then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and I was probably about seven, eight years old, and Eddie Graham was, you know, the the the, the man back in those days. And it was on Sunday after it was on Sunday after church on Channel Thirteen, which is one of our it was now Fox. Mm-hmm. Uh, at one o'clock, because we only had three channels back then, ten, yeah. eighteen, and thirteen. And they were on at one o'clock Sunday afternoon after church. Man, we had a blast. We all, all of us, me and my two, three cousins, would sit over there, and we we watch it, you know, every every Sunday. And you know, and I loved it and watched it and all that crap. And um, and my oldest cousin was a big guy. He was even at thirteen was over six foot, two hundred pounds. And, Oh, wow. His name was Eddie also, so when uh, commercials came on, he became Eddie Graham and beat us all up. (laughs) 
Okay. <laughs> so, so, yeah, uh, kind of. But, well, but getting back to hearing all that stuff, you know, it wasn't that, you know, I, I don't think Richard knew he was going into wrestling either at that time. Mm -hmm. Ricky, yeah. Richard, whatever you want to call him. And, yeah. you know, and I, you know, about that time, you know, I'm 15, 16, turning 17, and um, my friends are, you know, hanging out. We're all kind of, you know, doing things we probably shouldn't do, but they were doing, a, you know, they were doing, they were doing a little bit of things that are more criminal than I would and that I would like to do. And they were all ended up going to prison and this and that and everything else. And I said, well, I, hey, I'm not hanging out with you guys anymore. So, you know, I don't want to end up in prison. I don't want to go to jail. So I joined the Navy. Oh, okay. Wow. All right. Yeah. yeah. Took off. Went to Japan. Wow. Okay. Yeah. What was that like for you? Oh, geez. I'm telling you, brother, I ain't, I can't tell you all the stories in life about just, you know, yeah. you know, I was, I was, but it was my, you know, being in the Navy, obviously you're going to be on a ship and, you know, yeah. the boot camp here in Orlando. And, uh, and it was like, it was a picnic, you know, Yeah. it was easy. We, we, our, 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 uh, I don't know what you would call us back in those days, but you know, well, we'd watch, we'd sit up there, our company, I guess mm -hmm. you'd call it. We'd we'd sit up in our uh, in our barracks and watch everybody else do PT. They'd be <laughs> on the ground to do. They'd be out there sweating, doing calisthenics and that. We're sitting up there in the smoke room, smoking and going, these guys are nuts. They used to have to. They they couldn't even close the the, the chow hall down because we were always fifteen twenty minutes late. <laughs> yeah, we we had a blast. It was great. I got on the volleyball team when I was there. We beat everybody uh, in volleyball through the whole comp through the whole base. They were yeah. bringing they were bringing people from uh, that were graduating. You know. You know. Ahead, you know, way ahead of us and then and, and put their guys in and uh, try to beat us. And we, we, we took on everybody. We beat everybody out on the base over in wow. Orlando. Yeah. We wow. were just five of us and we stomped the crap out of them. Every one of wow. them. Wow. Yeah. That's, can, that's, that's an interesting story. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so, you know, they were looking for people to go overseas and they said, oh, you know, they said, oh, well, where would you like to go? I said, I'll go to Japan. And yeah. uh, me and three other guys, we took off and headed out and went to Japan. And they put us on an aircraft carrier over there called the USS Midway. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we all got stuck in the, in, you know, there was about six of us that came in that, Two of them were electricians, you know, two spots for electricians and four mm -hmm. uh, for ship fitters. You know, there so three of my, there's th four of us from my company. So mm -hmm. we all went to, you know, became a ship fitter, damage controlman, welder, ship fitter, you know, pipe fitter, you know, oh. every, you know, we, we did every, anything for repair. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, I be, that's where I learned to weld. You know, I worked in the carpenter carpenter shop. Uh, I worked in the lagging shop. I worked in the damage control shop. Uh, you know, I did. I was the number one OBO o, o, hose man, which is the guy up there hose you know, the nozzle is a firefighter. You know, oh. you're in the fire. You're the number one OBA. You're number one hose man. You're the one that's up there in front. Yeah. And then wow. I became scene leader, which means I sent all the messages back to damage control, you know, how we're progressing with the funding. So wow. I did real well with that as well. Became a third class petty officer. Okay. Uh, you know, we went to a lot of the other different countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my best things, uh, stories or events that happened was, uh, I took leave and went to, I went to the Philippines and I was there for 15 days mm -hmm. and, uh, staying at a hotel. And it was when, uh, Ali was fighting Frazier. The the oh, world. wow. Yeah. Yeah. I was a mile from the stadium and, wow. uh, you know, it was supposed to be 
uh, closed circuit TV, uh-huh. or you know, because it was on the show and everywhere else, you had to pay for it back when they first, you know, started doing all that stuff yeah. before it happened. Yeah. And um, Ali was messing around with President Marcos' wife, and uh, he didn't like that. <laughs> so he, he he said, "Well, I'm going to shut down." You know, he beat his wife up for Ali doing what he did to her. You know, yeah. that. but and uh, he said, well, "He says, you know, instead of being closed caption, he says you guys aren't going to fight unless you show it live here in the in, in the Philippines." So I'm sitting in a hotel, five Filipino women down in the hotel lobbies on the couch with me drinking ice cold. San Miguel beer, watching the thrill of Manila live on TV wow. a mile from the stadium wow. at 17, 18 years old. Wow. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Well, spent 15 days there. Boy, I was glad when the ship showed up. I was tired. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah, so, yeah. Now, yeah, so that's, you know, about the first 17, uh, 19 years of my life, you know, I got out of the Navy, I guess I was about 20. And, you know, uh, and, like, and, you know, but I had all this other stuff behind me as far as the skill sets that, you know, I mean, I could do anything in repair, you know, mm-hmm. you know, welding, yeah. pipe fitting, you know, I could be a plumber, but I wanted to be a welder. Because I had a f- friends here that uh, owned a steel company, mm-hmm. and uh, so when I got out of the Navy, uh, I went to welding school for a couple of years, and uh, so I got certified as a welder. Okay. But there wasn't much much work around here or anything like that. So yeah. that led up to the after I finished that, you know, about twenty one, twenty yeah, about twenty one years old at this point, twenty two somewhere in that area. Mm -hmm. Uh, My uncle, you know, uh, worked for the operating engineers, you know, uh, the union up in Knoxville. Okay. And there wasn't much going on construction around here back in those days. So, you know, we talked quite a bit and I told him, you know, that what I was doing and all that. I said, there's not much as far as work and all that stuff here. And he says, well, there's a lot of union work up here. You can come up here. So, I packed my bags and headed to Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh, there you go. And then uh, you did some work up there, and for... well, nope, I didn't get to do any work up there. Okay, and, you know, so you mean wrestling or? I welding. mean, you're welding, and then I, I, I want to transition to wrestling. I'm, I'm assuming this is going to transition into some wrestling. Well, yeah, that's where it all began. Knoxville. Yep. All right. Well, my, let's talk about that. Tennessee. How did you get involved in in uh, into the wrestling? The somebody contacted well, it, it, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't my intent. It was the furthest thing. I wasn't even thinking about it. I wasn't. You know, I was going up there looking to become. You know, go to work with the in the Boilermakers Union, mm-hmm. and because they had the big power plants up there at those times that they were building. Okay. So and they were paying pretty well. Back in those days, you know, 1979, 1980, mm-hmm. in those days, they were paying pretty decent money. And, uh, you know, so they said, well, you need to be certified. Okay. I said, well, I am certified. Well, they said, no, we need you certified one inch plate overhead. I said, oh, geez. So, uh. Uh, no, it wasn't overhead. I was th- I was already certified overhead at three eighths, so, but they said you need vertical certify on you know on a vertical uh, one inch plate, so they get you one inch unlimited, so you can weld anything at that point. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I and so I said okay, so I went down and you know I got certified, you know one inch plate, uh, unlimited. So then we. You know, so I'm all ready to go. Got my certification, my papers, and this, that, and everything else. And we call the the Boilermakers Union. He goes, "Y'all ain't from around here, are you?" <laughs> I said, "No, I'm not. I'm from Florida." So and then I said, 
so does that make a difference? He goes, well, no, we just pulled all the other guys off of this other job and stuck them over here at the, uh, at the power plant, and we don't need nobody else anymore. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. So all that stuff, everything I did for two years. Yeah. And gone out and got certified and all that, you know, left my, you know, here, Florida, mm-hmm. got up there and wow. no job. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That that would have been challenging, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> it was very challenging. Yeah. So, but I did get a job in the office, you know, with the guy, you know, doing all the payroll and this, that, and everything else. Which mm-hmm. was amazing because I didn't know how they could do that stuff. But uh, so I was the office worker and handled and managed the payroll and all that stuff and figured it all out, and sent it to everybody and managed it, you know. Yeah. And then sent it off to wherever, whatever state they were in at that point in time. And, uh, you know, everybody got paid. Right. Which, but it, it was a mess. An old Tennessee boy, and they, you know, if you, didn't, if you were off a half hour, they was pissed, and they came back after you. So they, and they brought guns when they didn't, they didn't get pay all their money. So, oh, yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't. Hey, pay me next time. I want it now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then they meant it. You know, yeah. They put. I mean, they, they had their guns, their pistols, and their in their in their in the waist. You know, and the, mm. it was like, okay. <laughs> and, and they start shooting off of a couple rounds here and there. You, yeah, let me see how I can write you a check, really. Yeah, quick. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, right. Uh, so I, anyway, I was uh, working there, you know, in the office and everything. And my uncle, who was a big wrestling fan at the time, mm-hmm. you know, and um, he always used to tell a story about the Bron Bronners or Bron Strohines or whatever. And one night, and he got to fight with his wife, whatever. And he was a big guy. And he was powerful. He was a fisherman out of Panama City. And, Okay. You know, and pulled the minutes back in them. They had forearms on it bigger than my neck. Oh, gosh, okay. And they were solid rock. I ain't kidding. Yeah. So he was, a, he was a pretty big guy. Yeah. And he was pretty funny. And, uh, and uh, he goes, well, why don't you become, why don't you go into wrestling? And I go, well, you know, I'm 165 pounds, you know. Yeah. I'm just shy. Back in that day, I was just shy of 5'8". Yeah. And, uh, you know, so 165, 5'8, I'm, I'm looking at him and going, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> no, no, I'm no guy. You know, they, they, they got into wrestling and all that. He said, uh, he's a mill worker, you know, the you know, millwright. And, uh, you know, I, I said, I can talk to him. I'm going, I, I don't know. I don't think this is the thing that we need to be doing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, he, he, you know, I'm getting frustrated at work and all that, you know, especially after he pulled guns on me several times, but, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Said, yeah. Yeah. So I said, well, okay, uh, you know, whatever. Let's, you know, let, he goes, he goes, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can get his number and he can call. Uh, okay. That's, uh, <laughs> well, you know, everything's a slow process. Yeah. And, uh, so finally he gets the guy's number and he gives me, I call him and all that. And he says, well, there's only, there's a guy, you know, that trains some people, but you know, I, I don't have his number, but I know where he hangs out at and you can give him a call there. Mm. Uh, and so it's, I'm going, okay, whatever. So he gives me the name of the guy and, uh, he gives me the number to the, uh, a Shoney's restaurant. Okay. Shoney's big restaurant, you yeah, know. Yeah. One of them all night places that you, you know, after you hit the bars all night, you go in and have dinner, yeah. or yeah. breakfast, or whatever the heck, you know, and that's it. So I'm going, I call down there, you know, the guy's name is Rick Connors. I don't know if you know him or not. No, I don't. Yeah, uh, and, uh, you know, one of the toughest guys in Knoxville. 
Okay. He's one bad man kind. He's a little, he, he's not much bigger than I was. He damn sure didn't weigh 200 pounds. But he was just, he was a boxer and he was a shooter. Uh, and, and you know, and that's how he that's how he lived life. You know, yeah. he'd look he'd go to all the colleges and the high schools and he'd look for people that he'd get on roll on the mats with, and that's what he did. Okay. And I mean, he, he wrestled professionally too. Okay. And he, he and he, he if somebody tried to mess him over in wrestling and all that, he'd take him down. He, I remember him telling me the story about taking one of the fullers down because they were messing with him and wouldn't let him back up on TV. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's how tough he was. But he's also won tough make competitions. So anyway, I leave my name, number, and all that. It's shown he's with the manager. Uh-huh. I'm going, this, yeah, this is the goofiest thing. I'm there. I can't believe it. <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks later, he calls me. Oh, Rick wow. Connors. Yeah. Right. He calls me. <laughs> you know, going, Holy crap. Really? <laughs> yeah. From Shoney's Big Boy Restaurant to... <laughs> yeah. Completely amazing. And uh, But anyway, he, you know, he calls me and he goes, you know, I, he talks to me a little bit and, you know, wants to know my background and you know, I and I don't have a, a big background. I'm mostly, you know, my thing. I, you know, I played a lot of sandlot stuff, but organized sports was was really kind of, um, you know, I played basketball. I played a lot of other things, but you know, never on a team or anything. Because I, I was a baseball player. That's, you right. know, that's who I was. You know, so I love baseball and I could play baseball. Yeah. You know, I I pitch. I was a catcher. I was, you know, I can play any position out there. And, you know, and, and played them all well. Yeah. So we're talking. And he goes, well, he goes, well, how big are you? And, uh, you know, how tall are you? So 5'8". Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and a little bit there. And goes, uh, we usually like you to be six foot. Yeah. Yeah, that ain't, that ain't happening. Uh, I think, you know, I'm already going, I see this is going downhill quick. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, he goes, how much you weigh? I go, oh, about 165, 170. And he goes, well, we need you to be about 200 pounds. I go, well, I, I can gain weight, you know, so that's not yeah. bad. So we talk a little bit more, and he's, you know, and he tells me a few other things and all that. And I said, he, he, he goes, well, I don't know. He says, you know, you don't fit tip, the typical, you know, criteria that I like. And, mm-hmm. you know, but he says, if you're interested, I'll be here at the bubble, which is the uh, training facility over at the uh, University of Tennessee, okay. UT, uh, at 4 o'clock. I go, okay. <laughs> I don't know why he said okay, but I did. <laughs> and I showed up, and I get there, and I meet him, and he looks like, you know, jet black hair, slick back. He looks pale white. You would have never thought that I could even get I don't think he came out during the day except for to, you know, roll around on the mat. He didn't, you know, he didn't leave the house any other day until, <laughs> you know, midnight. <laughs> he looked like drunk, you know. Yeah. He wasn't a big guy, you know. He wasn't that much bigger than, you know, taller than me. Yeah. And you know, and he was a, he was a country boy, you know. I mean, he was. Yeah. And uh, he got so he brings a friend of his, and you know that he rolls around with and does judo with, and you know, with uh he brings along to do the, uh, you know, to, I, I guess, indoctrinate me. Uh, I don't know. It wasn't a big guy either, to be honest yeah. with you. But so we get out, we do squats, we do push ups, we do this, we do that, you know, I'm just, which I'm fine, you know, all that stuff. Because my dad made me do that when I was a kid growing up. You know, we had a chin up bar in the doorway. We Every morning we had PT. I had to do push ups, had sit ups, had squats. I had to do chin ups every day. That was, you know, that's what, how I grew up, you know, when I was five years old, I was doing that stuff. Yeah. 
So, so doing that stuff there, you know, at the bubble, you know, that, that was purely not really that much, you know, because I was used to doing it because I did it most of my life anyway. Yeah. And, uh, so after that, he goes. Well, he goes. I want you to. I want you to wrestle with this, <clears throat> with this kid here. You know, we'll see. How, you know what you got. So basically, you know, a little bit of a tryout. So we we started. You know, amateur wrestling. And we're wrestling. I mean, we all wrestled through school and all that stuff. But mm-hmm. I was never on the wrestling team or anything like that. Right. You know, but I but I enjoyed wrestling, and I can you know I was squirmy, and I can you know I can go with the best of them. Yeah, and uh, so I, I the same thing happened with this kid. I, you know, I, you know, I was, I was per- fairly tough for you know, you know, for going through all that. And I, I didn't out wrestle the kid, and he didn't out wrestle me. And then we both shot on each other at the same time, and we collided <laughs> forehead. And oh, bang! Yeah, we we hit head head to head, <laughs> like two billy goats. Oh gosh. <laughs> And you know, and most people it would have probably dropped. And mm-hmm. I said, uh, you know, I just I, I didn't, you know, I didn't sell it. That sucks. Bam! <laughs> I hit that guy, and I looked at him. I I was getting ready to kind of it woke me up. I was bet ready to go at him again. And <laughs> Rick says, "Stop!" I, uh, you know, I, you know, I was gritting my teeth. I was getting a little pissed. Yeah. So we stopped, and Rick goes, "It's my turn." Oh, okay, so I'm warmed up now. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it, it was a different story with him, you know. Yeah. He, he, but most guys, they get sick, they get tired, they quit, they walk away. Yeah. yeah. And don't want to do it anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, I didn't give up. He, you know. Yeah. He, he, you know, he says if you can't go through, you know, it's just you know, you if. If I get you in a hold and you don't, you, you uh, can't continue, just tap. You know, we'll, we'll get up, start again. Yeah. You know, I, I, so I did once or twice to it. You know, I mean, I don't know, but I tapped a couple of times, and uh, but I kept getting back down and kept going with him, kept rolling, kept shooting, kept going, kept going, and yeah. and I didn't quit, didn't give up. So he goes, well, I don't know. He says, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's not really what I typically like to train. Mm-hmm. But he says, if you're interested, I'll be back here tomorrow at four. If you're interested, show up. Mm. Okay. Well, I showed up. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's... Every damn day for two years, I showed up. Oh, wow. Two years. Okay. Yeah. And so, I mean, so he, we became really good friends. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because he got a lot of respect for me. So, and he said, and he, you know, he always tells me, he said, he said, I did every damn day. I, he takes me out to the, in the football field over at UT, grind my face into the damn football field, you know, bust my ears open. I'd have grass stains in it, you know, my teeth and all that stuff. Or he's rubbing my face into the grass out there. I mean, he, yeah. he he put me through quite a bit, and then yeah. finally he tells me, he says, you know, he says I've done everything in the world I can do to run you off, and he says you keep showing up. <laughs> uh, I, I'm thinking to myself, hell, I got two older brothers, two older, you know, uh, you know, uh, three older cousins. One was a girl, so she never was involved, but two older cousins too. Mm-hmm. I said, you ain't anything, nothing. I got be, I might. I got my ass beat every damn day. I said, this is nothing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. So after you got trained uh, in, in Knoxville, did you work in Knoxville for a while and then go to other well, territories or how did that work? Well, you know, it's kind of funny. You know, we trained together because there wasn't, you know, Southeast was there with the Fullers and they'd are, they, they had, at this point had gone. There was uh Ronnie Garvin and Malenko and all of them separated from them and, you know, that, that pulled away from Southeast and the Fullers and tried to run off. But I didn't really know them. Yeah. Didn't really get to train with them. But, I, you know, it didn't make any difference to me because I was having fun because I'm training with Con- Rick Connors 
and he's training. He's putting me out there with the, uh, the University of Tennessee wrestling team. I'm training with some of the best guys in the damn world. Yeah. You know, one of them was uh, Fred Jahard was rated, you know, his Iranian guy was rated fourth in the nation. He's training me. He's training me. Yeah. This guy. This Iranian guy is training me. Wow. And Johnny Majors comes in and uh, says, I don't need you guys here anymore. He says, you need to you, you need to go somewhere else, do something else. So we go to Carson Newman College over in Morristown, Tennessee, 30 miles down the road. Mm-hmm. And they were ecstatic about having us come over there because, you know, they didn't have any heavyweights. They had one heavyweight. Yeah. And we spent we spent it we we spent a year over at UT and then we spent another year over there and then we started doing all the wrestling camps at all the high schools. Okay. Did this for two years. Yeah. And there wasn't no place to go to wrestle. There was just wasn't anything going on or anybody that I knew. Mm-hmm. And Rick wasn't doing that many shows anywhere. He'd go down and work with Nick Goulas down there and his area, you know, out of Chattanooga and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so finally, uh, Mulligan and Flair come in and they partnered up with, uh, with Jimmy Crockett. Okay. When we're running Southeast, uh, you know, you know, Mulligan and Flair, you know, Flair's not, he's world champion. So he's just coming in and out. You're right. And, uh, and you know, at that point in time, Rick and I was training Tim Horn. Okay. And um, so they come in, they open it up, they're doing TV and all that stuff. And they're getting some pretty good guys in there. They're getting, you know, the Mongolian Stomper. They're getting Kevin Sullivan. You know, we're getting uh, Tony Atlas, and Les Thornton. We're, I mean, we get some really, you know, top name, uh, Big John Stud. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, we got some, we got some talent going on there, you know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so they're doing TV every Saturday and all that stuff. But the only thing I could get to get them to, you know, the only thing they would let me do was TV. Okay. And, huh. and, but I, you know, here I am. The last two years, I'm, I'm freaking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now I'm 180, you know, 180, 185, and I'm in shape. Yeah. I'm like, you know, I'm freaking, you know, I'm, I'm every, I'm. I'm shooting twice a day, every day, for two years. Wow. Nine, ten o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you got Flair coming in, Terry Taylor coming in. I mean, we got some of the, you know, we, we got some really good talent going on. And it goes on for a while. They're doing really good. Barry Wyndham, you know, he was, mm-hmm. the, you know, Black Jack Mogan Jr. at that point in time. Right. I mean, but I'm still not getting the spot. And here go, you know, Timmy Horner's bigger than me, so Tim's working every night. I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> I trained the kid. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, finally Mulligan gives me an opportunity and, uh, and you know, and he says, what do you want to do? I said, well, I really like to work all the time. He goes, all right. <clears throat> and I and I never been in a ring in, until they came in. Right. Oh wow. Never, okay. never stepped in the ring. Never took a. Never. Well, we took balls, but they weren't <laughs> in a ring. Right. <laughs> you know. Uh, you know. Rick. Rick. He just he didn't have a. We, he didn't have a ring. We we were just on the mats the whole damn yeah. time. I mean, yeah. You know, I didn't even know. I didn't even know what a high spot was. And, yeah. So, you know, and I didn't even know what the ring felt like until one time I finally got up in the ring. And I went, oh, wow, that's what this feels like. <laughs> <laughs> Funniest thing in the world. But, yeah, I had to work with Mongolian Stomper and, you know, every Saturday. Kevin Sullivan, I had to work with him. Oh, dude, all the time. <laughs> yeah. And then all the local guys, you know, that uh, – that, that, that came, you know, that was trying to protect their image and this, that, and everything else, you know, that may have had a few things that they could do with. Um, they didn't want to do jobs on TV. I said, 
I'll work with anybody. I don't care what I do, you know? Yeah. Right. And, uh, so uh, this one guy had his gimmick was the Elvis Presley impersonator. And it, Mulligan tells him, you got to work a stud today on TV. And of course he's going to do a, you know, a smash job because, you know, he, yeah. big John, you know, <laughs> John is a big guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, he goes, no, no, I don't want to do that. He says, uh, let Denny do it. <laughs> and he said, that was Mulligan. You know, Black Jack Mulligan. And boy, you ought to have seen those, light, those eyes light up, man. It was unbelievable. I saw, you know, he, them eyes lit up. He didn't like that. But he just yeah. kind of looked over at me and he goes, what about it? I go, yeah. Uh, yeah, it put me in there. I don't care. I was why I'm here. I don't want to sit here and do nothing. Right. You know, yeah, whatever it takes, whatever I got to do, you know. So we yeah. started, you know. So they ran pretty good, did some, a lot of good shows. Yeah. I mean, I got to work with some really pe great people. I worked with Ox Baker, who I was scared to death of, up yeah. in, Fredericks in Fredericksburg, Virginia. You know, I'm out there. Here I am, a guy that watched Ox Baker, you know, the promos that he's always done. I'm going, this guy's going to kill me. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and I, we're up there in this little school place in uh, Fredericksburg, Tennessee, and he's the nicest guy in the world. He goes, you know, he we go to lock up, you know, I'm moving around, don't let him get a hold of me, and he goes, gut punch me. <laughs> and I, you know, and I draw back, and wow, you know, I hit him, and he sold that thing for a good ten minutes. 15 minutes, <laughs> putting me over just from a gut shot to him. Yeah. So finally, you know, he does the heart punch and, you know. Yeah. But, but it was the coolest thing in the world. You know, I'm here, yeah. I'm, I'm, because I don't know that it's a work yet entirely. Right. Yeah. You know, cause, you know I'm working with Flair and, uh, and uh, tagged up with somebody else. I can't remember who it was, but I'm with, you know, I do a tag match with Flair and uh, Terry Taylor on TV. And Flair walks up and goes, you know any spots? And I looked at him and I said, what the hell is a spot? <laughs> oh. Yeah, so, you know, it was fun. We spent a lot of time there. I got to go down to Chattanooga, and, you know, my, my trainer, Rick, wouldn't take me down there. I don't know, maybe he was a little afraid I'd embarrass him or whatever, but he had his own shot. He goes, if you want to go, just go down to and just make sure you take your gear. And I yeah. did, you know, so I did. And then um, and one guy didn't show up. And that's the first time I met Hector Guerrero, which is, you know, really mm -hmm. good, extremely, really good friend of mine. Because Hector and I worked together a lot, yeah. you know, here out of Florida. And it was a tag match, Crazy Lou Graham and me against uh, Fred Ward and Hector Guerrero. Okay. And the guy didn't show up. And then you know, Nick Goulas comes over and he goes, hey, boy, did you bring your stuff? Well, yeah. Yeah, he goes, all right, you need to get dressed. I'm going, really? <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I did. And uh, my first actual big match, I, you know, out of, out of, you know, I still stayed in Knoxville. Yeah. And uh, there, you know, so I got, I got to do that show. And, you know, we're still running out of Southeast. And then, you know, some other guys come in and uh, we start traveling and then heading down to, uh, Atlanta, I'm doing TV down there because they had Georgia Championship Wrestling. You know, they yeah. were still going on, on Saturday. Yeah. So I'm doing all three now. I'm doing a little bit of a ghoul list over there. Um, you know, a couple shows here and there, TV yeah. for them, TV for uh, Georgia Championship, and doing Southeast too, you know. So I got three different territories working in the South Star out of Knox. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, my, one of, you know, that, me and uh, Keith Larson, or you know, uh, Keith uh, Canole. I'm trying to think of his first name right off the bat, but, you know, and Don Canole's brother. Oh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I can't think of his name either. Now you caught me off guard there. Uh, well, but yeah, Keith Larson. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, we had to work with Snooker and uh, Terry Gordy, you know, put them over at Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And then I had to work with Bill Eady, and that was my, one of my first matches, you know, down when I first went to uh, Atlanta. 
Mm-hmm. And they, they work with Bill Eady. He's a mass superstar. You know, he's a Georgia champion or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. Nobody's really talking to me, telling me anything. Or comes over and says, hey, kid, what do you want to do? But they're certainly going to ask you, what do you want to do? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So, anyway, I'm working with Bill Eady. And we lock up. He, you know, go, does a duck under, go behind, waist lift, take down, boom, hit. I hit down on all fours. Well, guess what I've been doing for the last two years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sat out on him, <laughs> and uh, he, he didn't expect that. Yeah, and he truly did. Yeah, and, uh, and I sat out on him, and you know, when you sit out, turn around, pop up, and I square off with him. And he looks over, and you can see him through that mask. His eyes are all lit up and all that. He's grinning from ear to ear, and he's loving. It. Yeah. And uh, he came back, sought me out in the dressing room afterward, and shook my hand and thanked me. Oh, wow. Yeah, he said, thank you. He said, that was great. He said, I beat somebody today. <laughs> Wow. Well, most of the guys are just pancake out, and, you know. They can't, they, you know, yeah. squash it. Yeah. And he didn't, you know, he still squashed me, but at least the 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 first, you know, minute of it, there was, you know, I had all that fire, and I showed yeah. him that I was a wrestler, and I was going to fight back. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't your normal squash job, and he right. liked that because he actually got to beat a wrestler. Somebody, you know. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Let's talk, if we could, a little bit, Denny. Uh, you know, chemistry, you've had a lot of matches back in the day. Who was probably one of your favorite opponents that you wrestled against uh, that you just had chemistry with? You guys just flowed well, did everything, just perfect timing. Everybody. Everybody, okay. All right. Everybody. Everybody. Well, Hector was the first. Yeah. Hector Guerrero was the first. Gary Royal, right? <clears throat> the first thing when I when he left, uh, well, Hector and I, and, you know, Eddie Graham loved me. Yeah. Uh, you know, because I, when I first came to Florida, or when I, what happened was everything in the Southeast shut down. It all shut down. Okay. There was no, no territory. You know, Crockett shut him down because he didn't want them out, you know, shining him. Right. Yeah. So there was no place to – so when they shut down, there wasn't any place to go. Okay. No more wrestling. You know, so I'm going, geez, you know, no territory, no nothing, anything, and no job. So I came home. Okay. I came home. And uh, so I started doing, you know, it took me a while to get in over there. You know, the first guy I talked to was J.J. Dillon, and he gave, he, he just closed the door in my face. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Which was very disheartening. And, you know, and then, yeah. uh, so finally, uh, you know, all the guys from Southeast and this and that are coming down to the Bayfront Center, which is, you know, downtown St. Pete, from where I live here. Mm-hmm. And so I figured I'd go down and go and see them. And say hi, Les Thornton was there, and I knew Les because I traveled with him a little bit and everything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and Flair was there that night. Of course, I worked with Flair. Yeah. So I knew him. And um, so I figured I'd go down and say hello. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did. I go down there, and I got me a job down here. I'm working, you know high rises, you know, welding and stuff like that. I finally got my job and everything that I needed. And uh, so, you know, as a welder. Right. And then, and then uh, so I go down to the Bayfront Center and they're having a big show down there. And I, unless comes out, you know, out to one of the little areas that comes towards the, you know, where, you know, audiences and all that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I walk over and say, hey, how you, you know, he, he knew who I was right off. And he goes, hey, brother, how you doing? You know, yeah. what's over? You know, and he goes, are you working? I go, yeah, yeah, I got a job down the street over here. I'm uh, out on the beach when I'm welding. He goes, no, are you working? I said, I'm, yeah, I'm welding. No, <laughs> are you working? <laughs> I'm going, 
oh, you mean in the business? He goes, yeah, no, you in the business. And I go, no, nobody will talk to me. Yeah. And, he goes, and uh, he, go, he goes, oh, shit. He goes, follow me. Yeah. So, um, I go, oh, so, yeah, you know. So I, I took a shot, took a chance, and, you know, and then I did. I met Les, and he takes me back into the dressing room. And he comes and he goes, here, I'm gonna, you, know, just, you know, just follow me. He says, don't say nothing. Just There's a table there. He goes, just sit on this table and just don't move. <laughs> well, you know how the boys are. You know, they're all going to come by and say hi and introduce themselves and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. But, you know, but I already knew Flair. I know Les. And, you know, and so Flair comes over and he's, you know, he's, we're talking. And, you know, he's, you know, he's going, good to see you again. You know, stuff. And Dory Funk Jr. is the booker at the time. And, you know, uh, so they know, well, they all know what's going on, you know. I'm yeah. just a new kid in the round. But Les knows me. Flair knows me. And, you know, after a little while, Dory comes up and he goes, uh, uh, he's got his book. I guess he's doing those shows of this or whatever, you know. And he goes, uh, can you make TV Wednesday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what time do you want me there? Four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, geez, come on. Oh, yeah, geez. this is one sitting. Yeah, no, you know, I'm just kidding. So, so yeah, that's what you know. I, I so I, that's I go. Yeah, I can make TV Wednesday. I'm just dying to make TV on Wednesday. Yeah. So I go in and I work with Jimmy Garvin that day, and I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm still in shape, you know. Plus, I'm fine. I'm. I'm you know, I was, I'm doing ten-story buildings. Right. You know, then they you know, I'm you know I'm the welder. You know, doing welding, put stairs in, and this, that, and everything else. And I, you know, and if I run out of oxygen or acetylene on my tanks, you know, I I grab them and you know, I throw them on my shoulder, and I'm I I I don't take them up the elevator. I walk them on my shoulder. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Ten flights of stairs. I'm still pumping. Yeah. Not many guys can do that or even right. want to. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so anytime I get a chance to do something, that's what I did. And so, you know, I was up there working and all that. And then, you know, started doing TV every Wednesday. I was telling my boss about it, you know, going down. I worked with Jimmy Garvin the first time. I'm like 90 miles an hour to, you know, just in came while you see me. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, give me a backdrop. You got to make sure I'm close to one side because if not, I'm flying out of the ring altogether. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. So I work with Jimmy Garvin, and he just they they're, they're loving it. Everybody's in awe. You know, it's just you know they couldn't believe it. Yeah. And, and then uh, every 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 day, every Wednesday, they come in and they they go. You know the the matches are up on the, on the wall and all that. And they're seeing who's working with who and everybody's coming in. They're going, who's working with the kid? Who's working with the kid? And, you know, they're all, <laughs> they, they, you know, cause I had a lot of respect for those guys. It was more than I ever could imagine. Yeah. And, and then they started using me a lot more, you know, I mean, I could, you know, I, I, before Dusty came in, I was working, you know, uh, when Dory was still the booker, Terry Allen was, Magnum TA was teaming up with um, uh, Brian Blair at the time. Okay. And, and you know, so he blew, blows out his knee. He's done. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and Eddie's, you know, he's, he's, he's coming down all the time. He's talking, Eddie Graham, coming down, talking to me. Wow. You know, he, you know, always checking on me. Hey, kid, you know, this is what I want to see you do. This is just that, anything else, you know, and I said, yeah. you know, so, so one day, you know, uh, my boss or well, my job tells me, he says, you can't take any more Wednesdays off. If you do, you're fired. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so I got to work, you know, uh, my job. And then I get the call from Dory and Dory goes, I need you to come down and do TV. And I go, Dory, I can't come down to do TV this one. He goes, I really need you. <laughs> well, just doing TV. How bad can it be? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. You know, I can't. I said, if I do, I will lose my job. I'll get fired. So he hangs up. Five minutes later, Eddie Graham calls me. Yeah. 
Oh, I'm going, you know, they the same story. You know, yeah, I need you to come do TV. And I guess they must have been in the office. I don't know if they were in the office together or whatever. He, I guess, or he had, at least Dory had it done that I wasn't coming to do TV. And uh, so I tell him, you know, I tell Eddie, I can't do it. Yeah. And he goes, oh, shit. <laughs> I go, yeah, that's Eddie's, you know. Either good or bad. Oh shit! And then, you know, yeah. If it was bad, you were gone. If you were, you know, if it was a good one, you, you know, yeah, you met, you were going somewhere. So, you know, I told him no. He hangs up. Dory calls me. We go to the same spill. I said, No, nah, Dory, I can't. I said, I gotta have a job. I can't just survive on, you know, one day a week, Wednesdays, you know, morning TV. Yeah. So, so he, he uh, Eddie calls me back again. Holy crap, what the heck is, you know, I mean, you know, mm-hmm. and this is, this is Eddie. I said, I, I, Dory just, I just hung up with Dory. I told him I couldn't, you know, and he says, hey, look, you get, we really want you to come down. We really want you to do TV. I'll pay you double what I pay everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I said. Who, yeah, you don't tell Eddie Graham no. Yeah, right. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so, so I said, okay, you know. And uh and he, and he really took an interest in me. He really did. It was really yeah. amazing, you know. And um so uh so I do it. I go down, I go to take T V, you know, the Wednesday morning. Uh, I go to work Thursday, <clears throat> come in and got fired. Yeah. Yeah, you know. So I had to go down and pick up my check and everything like that. And I don't remember if you, I don't know if you ever remember Charlie Lay. Uh, I don't believe so. I don't well, the right he, name doesn't ring a bell. He worked the desk at the Sportatorium here in Tampa. Okay. And uh, Charlie was an old wrestler way back in his day, big old cauliflower ears and stuff, you know. Old guy, you know, you'd walk in. He'd never let you through the door. He was the gatekeeper. Okay. <laughs> And, you know, if you walked in and he didn't want you going through or he didn't, you know, or he didn't have anything to say, either you walk in and say, hey, Charlie. And you go, hey, he'd leave, he'd stretch, and he'd go all the way back, and he'd hum, and never get excited about nothing. <laughs> and if you couldn't get in the dressing room, he wouldn't let you in because you stood right there. Uh-huh. And so after all this had happened, and all that, you know, because the match that they wanted me to come do was to work with Dory on TV. Oh, okay, wow. And uh, and Dory, I guess, needed somebody to fire up, you know, you know, have somebody that he needed to beat, and I was freaking fighting my ass off, you know, in that match, and I guess they enjoyed it. Yeah. And then, uh, so I, I come in to pick up a check, and I and I walk in. There's Charlie Lay. You know, you know. He, I walk in, and he, I, he about shit his pants. And I said, Charlie. You know, he jumps up and goes, oh, hey, hey, hey. Instead of going back, leaning in his chair, <laughs> he comes forward, and he's, you know, I'm going. I never seen a guy have that much energy in my life. Yeah. And you know, he goes, oh, kid, wait, 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 just wait right here, wait right here. And he's stumbling around all that, you know, all thumbs and all this and that. And he gets on the phone. He goes, "He's here." <clears throat> I'm looking around. I'm going, Is somebody else standing around here besides me? <laughs> yeah. He goes, let's, let's wait, wait one second, one second. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, I'm standing there still uh, looking at him. I'm befuddled. You know, I'm going, you know, why? You know, what the heck? Did, you know. So he, the door opens to the dressing room in the back there and all that. It's Eddie. Then oh. again, Eddie. Yeah, and I'm going, to, you know, and he, got, and he goes, hey, kid, he goes, kid, how, how you doing? Everything okay? And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, how you, how's your job? How'd everything go with that? I said, they fired me. <clears throat> you know, here's t- Eddie's typical response. Oh, shit. <laughs> don't worry, kid. Don't worry, kid. I, I'll find something for you. Well, I just told you the story about Magnum blowing out his knee. Yeah. You know, working tag team semi main events with Brian Blair, and yep. he's done. So, guess who takes the spot? Denny Brown. 
Seven nights a week, brother. Oh, wow. That's that's awesome. And we're tearing down the dang house. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, I'm putting this over on TV, this, that, that. Oh, man, geez, climbing in. Man. I'm, I'm living life. I'm working six nights a week, seven nights a week. I'm making money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm home doing TV every week, and I'm still working as, a, you know, by, if I, I still got a job, you know, uh, well, not yet. I, you know, I didn't have that job anymore, but uh, the welding job. Right. But I'm working six, seven nights a week, you know, in semi main events, and I'm freaking loving it. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, and then that's when Dusty comes in. <laughs> yeah, changes everything. You don't know how bad that just, uh, just like sucking all the air out of me, just taking all the oxygen out of the room. Yeah. You know, he goes, I know you're a talented kid and all that. He says, but I just don't have a spot for you right now. Because he comes in and Dory leaves and then they're changing. He's got to bring his team in. Mm -hmm. I can't even understand it and all that stuff and everything. Yeah. So now I'm, he goes, but if you want to do TV, you can still come in to TV. I'm going to do it. Okay. <laughs> so, so I do. So, But then my friends, who I told you earlier, that had a steel company here. Mm -hmm. Let me go to work for them, and they don't care that I take off all in the Okay. You know, so I'm hanging steel out down here in Florida. You know, you know, summers in Florida, hanging up on that. Yeah. You know, welding. You know, hanging steel. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an actual steel worker. I'm, you know, hanging steel and welding and this and that, and fabricating paint. I do it at all. Right. And then everybody that's coming up to, you know, and I'm still on TV every night, Channel 44, 7 p.m. on one of the hottest shows in the freaking country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and everybody, everybody sees me, and they're coming by, go, you know, I'm up there hanging, I'm on top of a building. You know, we did a lot of strip mall, strip stores, you know, which was just a single-story building. We didn't do any yeah. high rise. So I'm up there walking, I'm walking around up there on the steel or hanging over, you know, tight, you know, running bolts or welding this, that. And they go, and they all recognize me. Everybody recognizes me. Yeah. So they love it. We're all having, I'm having conversations hanging. I'm sitting straddled on top of the, you know, on, on the, on a, on a wall, then 15 feet in the air. People wanting to talk. On the other <laughs> Let's do it. So at that point in time, you know, then uh, that's when Dusty comes over and takes over, and finally he comes to me and all that stuff. And Eddie's still coming down, telling me how to do my finishes and tell me how to how to you know how to do work spots, this that. He's still coaching, right? And you know, and, and and Dusty, every time I'm doing TV, you know, he's going and I walk him back in after the match, and I look up at him over there, and he's got a he's got his book and all that stuff. And he goes, gold star for Denny Brown. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I love it. You know, I'm working with yeah. all the big guys down there, Black yeah. Ball, Ron Bass, Mark Lewin, and they're all letting me pick them up, slam them, fire up, come back. Tonga taking him down on, you know, fireman's carriers. For, you know, and yeah. everybody's loving it. You know, so I just, it was really a, really a cool time for me. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I really got to work, and I could work with anybody, everybody. Yeah. yeah. And, wow. you know, and it was just, uh, it was just I didn't, I, I, you know, I, I fit in just like, yeah. you know. And, but then Hector comes in. And so he's the first guy I get put with. You know, Eddie goes to Hector and goes, he says, I want you to work with him. He says, the kid's got something. He says, so, you know, I'll work with him. So we are every freaking night. Yeah. You know, first, second, third match. We're tearing the house down. Yeah. And then Chavo comes in. So the same thing with Chavo. You know, we're doing the same thing. And mm -hmm. I'm so young. I'm still learning. You know, and they're walking me through it because you know I, it, it, a lot of that stuff I didn't even know. He just, you know, I didn't even know what a spot was up in Knoxville. And here we are, yeah. starting to do all this stuff and educating me and 
you know, telling me this is what we're going to do. So I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. Yeah. I'm learning. And then, you know, Mike Rotunda comes in and Mike Davis is there. Now these guys are psych- giving me the psychology. Yeah. They're, they're, they're putting the nuts and bolts into the, you know, in between everything else that's going on in the world and wrestling for me. Yeah. And that happened. And that's when Dusty comes in and tells me I'm junior heavyweight. I'm, you know, junior heavyweight champion. I win the tournament and all that. And I'm one of the, and then, you know, then Eddie and uh, Dusty had that falling out the big show down in Miami. And then I'm heading up. Yeah. You know, you know. Then, uh, you know, I, I didn't know that him and uh, I didn't know they had a falling out between the two of them. I didn't know that, you know, so yeah. we're over here at USF, you know, at the Sun Dome. We're doing a big show there. And, you know, and I guess Kevin takes over his book, but nobody says anything. I didn't know that. Yeah. You know, and Kevin knows me, you know, Kevin, because I've worked with Kevin, you know, quite a bit and knew him well. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, he, he asked me if I can make a town. It's like, why is he at, you know, I didn't understand why he was asking me because I, you know, I mean, can I make a town? Oh, oh, I work here. You know, I'm going wherever you want. <laughs> And about that time, Dusty sees him and walks up, and he bumps into both of us, and he goes, no, he's going to be in Charlotte. And I went, uh, yeah. I went, what the? Yeah. <laughs> and I guess I, I, I look at Kevin and go, I guess I'm not. <laughs> oh, be able to wow. make it. Yeah. So, so the first show, I get up there, you know, um, still working, still doing everything, but I, I can work with everybody. Everybody, but I go to uh, we, we got a show that I got to work with uh, Gary Royal, and that's the, finally the whole full cruise there from Florida that Dusty brings in. Okay, <clears throat> we're a newborn. I think it's newborn, 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 newborn. North Carolina on the coast up there, which they saw, which our TV filtered from Florida over into that area, so they knew who we were. Uh, okay. And that place, it was the, the rafters were packed. Yeah. I mean, it was just full. And, and I worked with Gary Royal. And I, it was another guy. I didn't know the guy from Adam. We couldn't yeah. talk to him. Didn't be, you know, didn't be, nothing. We get out there in the, in the ring and we freaking ripped the house down. Wow. First, first match. Yeah. Wow. And, and Dusty, boy, I walk back in and Dusty's just grinning ear to ear. Yeah. yeah he cool. loved it. He, uh, everywhere. Yeah. He took, I was for sure. I was first match with him everywhere. He told yeah, I remember him telling the guy, he says, this is my, this is my, this is my guy here. He, he's the first match. He puts yeah. in the line 30 minutes every night, at least. I, mean, I do 30. Uh, uh, most of my matches never went under 30 minutes because I, yeah. It was all, a lot of, did a lot of, you know, uh, draws, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you don't you don't see that anymore. No 30-minute yeah. matches. Yeah, well, I, I did it because, you know, it was a two-hour show, and, you know, a lot yeah. of them, you know, 15, 20 minutes. So, you know, I, I put it all, he says, this is a guy that puts in my time to first match. Yeah. All the time. And, I was, and that's, I, that's how I made my living. That's... Well, you got quite an amazing story. Pat Tanaka. He put me with all the guys. Pat Tanaka. What a guy. You know, he and I yeah. was the same way. Uh, George Sal. Um, I can't, you know, say enough about Gary Royal. Yeah. Hector was you know, amazing. Uh, Tully Blanchard pissed him off one night. Me and Hector were first up in Ohio. And he comes out of the dressing room and he's watching it and all that. Arn Anderson standing there, Telly Blanchard there, and Hector and I have a match together. And, uh, and Telly goes, "How in the hell are we gonna follow that?" <laughs> Arn looks over at him and goes, "He goes, if you can't follow that, then you don't they deserve to be on top." You know, Arn, he, he was amazing the way that you know he was. Think he could, yeah. You know, as far as he, he was just funny, you know. But he told him, yeah. "Come right now, you can't." You know, and I worked with this uh, Italian Italian. Uh, I can't forget. I forget his name. Oh yeah, Italian Italian. Yeah. Yeah, and everybody had a hard, you know, because he didn't, he couldn't figure out a lot. You know, he just, you know, he was, 
He's a great guy, fun guy, and I traveled with him and all that stuff, and we had a lot yeah. of fun together and all that. And uh, I, I had to work with him first match one night. We went out there and had a match with him, and I'm walking back, and I get back to the dressing room uh, before I get inside to go in there. He, Arn's standing there, and he goes, what you did, and I went, oh, shit. <laughs> I messed up here. He said, you just had the best match of that kid's entire life. That was low. Wow. Wow. Big compliment coming from Art Anderson. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could work with anybody. Yeah. It's just, and there was a lot of guys. But there was, it wasn't all me. I mean, you had to have people that, you know. Well, yeah. yeah. Those other guys. And, and then I started going to, you know, and then when I became world champion, you know, I went I went to Puerto Rico, Kansas City, you know, uh, Southeast, which was down in Pensacola at the time. And mm-hmm. I was just working with doing double world title nights with Flair. And, and I, I mean, I'm really, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm jet set. We go to Japan, I, you know. Yeah. Wow. Just a lot of different things, and it yeah. was just amazing to me because I it, was, it wasn't something that I seeked, right? You know, yeah. in, in life to go do. It was just one of those things that, think you know, event after event after event, just it, it all just like domino fell into place. You know, when one got knocked down, and it came up to the next one, and it got knocked down. You know, mm-hmm. and it just kept, the, and like I said, the domino effect. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, and it went on for a lot of years, and then they started changing the formats. And, you know, they wanted bigger guys, and that really got me lost. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, so I started getting used a lot less, and you know, <clears throat> which led into things that uh, you know that I didn't, probably shouldn't have been doing, but you know. Yeah. <clears throat> and you know, Ricky and Robert, Robert Gibson of the Rock and Roll, he mm-hmm. called me yesterday. You know, he still calls me all the time. Yeah. And I, I go fishing with Rotundo all the time. You know, he just lives up here in Brooksville, 75 miles north of me. Okay. You know. And, wow. And, um, yeah. So we're, we're still 40 years fishing together and yeah. wrestling this, that, and, you know. And uh, yeah. Robert gets the same way and, you know, he, yeah. Uh, Manny Fernandez calls me all the time. Hector, call, you know, Hector yeah. and I are still good friends. He's over in Tampa. Manny, you know, he's always calling me. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I've maintained a lot of really great friendships. Yeah. And we do the luncheon deals over there, you know, the uh, uh, Championship Florida yeah. Wrestling, the luncheons, reunions, and stuff like that. Good. That's that's great. It's not, I, good you guys keep in contact. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I've met Mike Rotunda uh, in Dallas last April and nice guy. Same with Robert and Gibson, Ricky Morton. I met those guys, just two great guys, uh, two gentlemen. So, yeah. And I got to say, this interview with you has been great. I've really, uh, I've learned a lot of Mr. <laughs> Denny Brown. So, one last question for you, Denny, if you don't mind. What are you doing now, sir? What are you up to? Well, you know, things have really changed. It's really true. I'm here lately. I had a, I did a podcast here about a month or so ago, two months ago. I don't know. And then you called me to a pod, you know, want to do a podcast. So I, I think people are starting to get, you know, hear some things and see things and, yeah. getting to hear a story about me that people really never knew. Yeah. And um, I'm doing the gathering for in Charlotte this next August, I believe it is. Oh, wonderful. Good. Yeah. And um, so I haven't done anything since 2013, to be honest, you know, maybe one or two some things here that nobody really wants to give me anything for. So, yeah. <clears throat> you know, the, the thing that hurt me throughout my career was that I wasn't a camera guy. I, I, my, you know, my whole deal is I love being in the ring. I love being a showman. I love working. I, yeah. You know, it was one of my favorite things. I didn't care about nothing else at that yeah. point in time. It didn't really make a damn bit of a difference to me. Mm-hmm. I wanted to get up there and go whatever time that I had to be able to show off the talent, the skills, mm-hmm. 
and you know the type of things that I could do in a ring that would to just in, in regardless of who it was, yeah, then I could have a fantastic match. You know, whether it be five minutes, ten minutes, and most of the times it was thirty minutes. You yeah. know, George Smith is another great guy, and yeah. uh, you know, and still, you know, still good friends with him to this day. And it's just, uh, it was an amazing adventure for me, you know, but being able to get into uh, out there in front of the keyboard, just, you know, I could have done a lot better and probably have more, uh, activity being able to go out and go do mm -hmm. signings and be at different shows and, you know, those types of things had, I, you know, had more face time and a camera yeah. and all that and been able to do the things that they really wanted me to do as junior champion. Yeah. Not just to be the belt, you know, hold the belt, the title, and yeah. uh, work the bosses, but they wanted me to be a personality, which is something that um, I didn't really, it didn't, because nobody ever really talk, sat down and talked to me about it. You right. know, nobody ever told me, you know, got down around and said, you know, give me the nuts and bolts of behind the scenes what needed to be done. Yeah. Like they did, you know, like Mike Rotundo and Mike Davis did as far as working in the ring. And yeah. that's where I that was my expertise. That's yeah. who I was. Yeah. I, I, you know, being on the mat and going over, I, I've incorporated an amateur style into professional style where I could work the two and do everything in the ring at the, you know, and, and get, and get over with it by yeah. doing that. Type yeah. of stuff. And then and, and that's what really made me, um, that's what, well, I guess that's what you really say. That's what really made me, you know, yeah. the, that type of a skill that I had. Yeah. And I gave it all back to the guy that trained me, Rick Connors, you know, yeah. God bless him. I love him to death, you know, yeah. and uh, he's still with us, you know, he's not doing it in the best of health, but, you know, I call him still, I'm the only guy that still talks to him. Yeah. And, and, he, and he says, you know, he says, after you, he says, he said you were the best student I ever had. He tried to run me off. You're the best student <laughs> I ever had. And he said, you know, and then after I trained you, you became world champion. He says everybody wanted me to train him, and I went. <laughs> so he said I made money after that, yeah. and I said, well, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mini version of you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you this real quick. Do you think? If you had a manager, uh, you know, you talk about your FaceTime in front of the camera and all that besides being in the ring. If you had a manager, because some guys need a manager to talk for them. I mean, some guys just yeah. did, couldn't. Well, yeah. Do you think that, I mean, like, if you know, JJ or, or, or Cornette or yeah. somebody like that, yeah. NWA, because yeah. that's what you're yeah. You think that would have made a difference for you as far as your camera Absolutely. time? Absolutely. Well, it would have given me an opportunity to be able to, to mold myself into somebody that could be able to stand in front of the camera and talk about stuff. Yeah. You know, and and be able to you know become a personality because I never I didn't know you know I never had a personality I never knew who I was. Yeah. You know they never my name is Dennis Brown. No, you know come on, can I don't I get a gimmick? I can't be nobody else. No, so I became Denny Brown, downtown yeah. Denny. But that's my downtown. name. Yeah. That's, but that's my name. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so I, I never got, so I never, I never escaped from that. So yeah. it had, I had the opportunity to be able to escape from that aspect of it yeah. and find a personality that I can become. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It would have changed everything. I would have, yeah. I would have, I, there's no talent, uh, you know, the, the, the limits yeah. or the things that I have could have become yeah. had I had an opportunity to get into that. Yeah. Aspect of it. You know, have a, start off with a manager. Start off with somebody that can help coach. Mm -hmm. Your coordinate, she's, you got to be kidding me. Or Jay, somebody would sit there and talk to you and tell you, well, you need to think about these things, you know. Yeah. Instead, I, you, you know, when, yeah. yeah. I'll just leave, I'll, I'll rattle through. Okay, me. sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to rattle your cage. I just think, because, no, you no, know, no, 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 no. I mean, I, me rattle. I need to oh, rattle okay. my cage. I get to the point where I'll start talking. Oh, I'll you're fine. Me. No, you're fine. I just think, you know, like the Midnight Express, right? Those guys never said two words on the camera. Oh, Bobby, you couldn't talk. Right. But I'm saying that's exactly my point. If they, yeah. if you would have had somebody like Cornette who did all your talking for you and you just stood there and had your the look there that, that they wanted or whatever, 
I think, honestly, you would have been over a lot more. I mean, like you said, I called you. I called you. I remember you as a kid. I remember you, uh, you know, and I was watching Starcade a while back, and I was like, I got to get a hold of him. Uh, and I would <laughs> like him on our po my podcast. Because some of you guys are so, like yourself, Danny, are under appreciated in this in the business that's my personal opinion i think that's the opinion of a lot of other people that if you go back 35 years when you guys were at the height of your careers a lot of you guys you know kind of got get underappreciated and i want to bring you guys on my show and tell your story and get it out there for people like oh yeah i remember him and then they start looking up stuff hopefully um. Yeah, I mean, you're very underappreciated, and I want to tell you that. And I think you had a great career, and you know, I just want to let you know that from my my point of view. So, you yeah. know, well, my brother was six too, and I'm I'm pissed off because it made me <laughs> only five eight. <laughs> but you were a wrestler, and your brother wasn't. No, no, but he 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 was still an athlete nonetheless. Yeah. Probably you know, one of the best. Yeah, we were we were that. He he and I were, you know, we were molded by, uh, uh, you know, my dad was just an animal. You know, he wasn't a big guy either. He was only five nine himself. He wasn't a big yeah. guy. Yeah. And uh, you know, but he was uh, he was Native American. He was a yeah. uh, country boy out of. I uh, grew up on a farm in a, a place called uh, No Water, Dewey, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Bartlesville, and uh, you know, not that I ever claimed the right to be the Native American because I don't know, I didn't grow up that way, but he was, and so right. I guess I did as well, you know. Right. You know, but I'm also Irish too, so I don't know which is the good side of me. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for coming on here, uh, the podcast, Danny. I really appreciate it. Well, I, you know, I, I appreciate you having me and giving me yeah. the time to yeah, actually, you know, to tell my story. You and, bet. You know, just, you know, some of the amazing things that happened in my life, you know, with, with that, you know, yeah. and everything from, the, you know, growing up. And yeah. everybody as a kid, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, beat me up in the neighborhood. So, you know, <laughs> like I said, if, if yeah. that's all you got, then, you know. Yeah. Everybody else would beat me up, so you know you ain't gonna hurt me any more than what I've already been. Yeah. So, well, but it's been great. I appreciate you giving me the time. And I do have another show uh, signing coming up. Uh, the uh, uh, you know I think January, February, probably more February. Okay. So I, I do that too next this uh, next year. The okay. Gathering Four is the big one with uh, yeah. uh, Marty the yeah. model. Yeah, um, in Charlotte, and I'll be there Thursday and Friday. He's got me in as a VIP for the second spot uh, behind Kurt Angle. Which, you know, oh, hey, all right, there you he, go. He, 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 I'm number two behind Kurt Angle, which is a great honor for me as well. You know, yeah. I never met, I don't know him that you know at all. Yeah, yeah, that's that's <laughs> wonderful. All yeah. right, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Denny Brown, sir, thank you again for coming on. Really appreciate it. No, oh, my pleasure. All right. And folks, if you're listening, thank you so much. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. And we will talk to you soon.